This morning, our speaker is fresh off the duties of co-hosting our recently concluded Summit 2020, and just yesterday, again, she assisted in facilitating the first strategy session. But being a facilitator is what she does in her professional capacity. So friends, please help me welcome practitioner Sandra Cooper, newly elected chair of our TMC, and this morning she will bring us a message which I'm sure will be a call to action. Sandy, please welcome. Good morning, Good morning friends. friends. It is a, it is joy, a joy for me for to meet you here, here this, morning. this morning. Especially, Especially those for those of you joining, joining us on the World, World Wide Web. We took, we took the time, those of you who are here took the time to get up, dress up, and show up. And those of you are, who are online, maybe sipping a cup of coffee, being comfortable, it is so good to have you here. Now, some weeks ago, I think Jennifer preempted me. The Thriving Ministry Council elected new leadership, replacing its retiring chair and vice chair. The election required council members to nominate individuals they thought fit for the role. Before proposing names to the council, members had to speak first to the nominee and ascertain that person's willingness to serve. I received a call asking me to accept the call as nomination. I thanked the person for thinking of me and declined as graciously as I could. Soon afterwards, I received a second call from someone else, and once again, I turned them down. You see, I was absolutely clear that I didn't want the responsibility or accountability required of leadership, as I was hard-pressed enough to serve my clients and keep my business viable. I didn't think I would have the time for the kind of commitment that I believed was required for the role as chair of such an august body. But friends, were I to be honest, deep down, I was terrified. Niggling questions arose in my mind like, suppose I fail, what, what if I got it wrong? What if, what if, what if? Have you ever had doubts like that where your mind questions your, your ability to do something, have you? Mm-hmm. Two more calls followed and I had to stop and ask God, what on earth are you trying to tell me here? Didn't you hear that I said that I don't want this cup? Is there something you know that I don't? Well, before I had articulated these questions, the following thought popped into my consciousness. I am choosing you because you are the right person and this is the right time and you have gifts to share. Before I had time to chew on that idea, <laughs> The fifth call came, and I said yes. Friends, in my professional life, I engage with many leaders for whom I provide what I hope to be valuable support to their planning, employee development, and personal empowerment. My last formal leadership role was over two decades ago, and I hated it. I made a promise to myself that I would avoid the responsibility of formal leadership for as long as I had the ability to choose. Yeah, right. This month, <laughs> I celebrate 15 years running my own business. What an irony. If that isn't leadership, then I don't know what is. So here I am, chair-elect of the Thriving Ministry Council. After that election, I asked myself, what just happened? I know I wasn't drunk. And I don't recall consuming the pee of a crazed feline. I concluded that I must have been under the influence, but not of alcohol, but of the presence and power of spirit. It's a different kind of spirit. 
It was a life-changing realization, and it generated even more rumination. So as my spiritual family, you are going to get the full monty of my reflections this morning in my message, which I have entitled, Leading Under the Influence. Friends, leading in any church community has to be motivated by more than pay, power, or personal glory. It takes great personal strength for ordinary people to take on leadership, and the depth from which that strength comes must be spiritual. The Bible has many stories of ordinary people who found the inspiration they needed to overcome great obstacles and become extraordinary and legendary leaders. For example, Noah, he built an ark to save himself, his family, and a host of animal life from the destruction that he believed was imminent because God told him so. Nobody believed his stories about the impending flood. Yet he persevered, proving that leaders do what's right even if they are alone. Joseph, he was sold into slavery by his jealous brothers. He was framed and thrown into prison while in Egypt. However, because of his gift of interpreting dreams, he became the leader of all Egypt, second only to the Pharaoh himself. Leaders have a vision that sustains them through difficult times. Then there is Moses. Oh, he protested strongly as to why he wasn't the right guy for the job. He stuttered, I mean, he made all kinds of excuses. When he finally does answer his calling, according to legend, he was able to step up and lead over 600,000 Israelites out of Egypt. Leaders stick up for their people. And David, now this is a little shepherd boy with a slingshot. And we read how he overcame the Philistines nine foot giant Goliath, proving that one can face any challenge as long as there is conviction and strength of resolve. Leaders are not afraid of big challenges. Peter denied knowing Jesus three times. Yet later, we see Peter giving the first sermon after Jesus' ascension to a crowd of thousands amongst whom he had denied Jesus just a few days earlier. Leaders don't become discouraged when they fail. Well, now that I've had time to accept the role in consciousness, the quality of leadership I will bring has been influenced wholeheartedly by the principles of truth I learned at the feet of one of the most revered leaders I've ever been blessed to know, Reverend Dr. Elma Lumsden. Not only did I receive a thorough grounding in the science of mind from her, but I learned how to apply these principles in my life in practical ways. For example, I learned very early that life responded to my thoughts. I learned about the power of prayer, what we call spiritual mind healing treatment. I learned that words create worlds. I learned to tune into my inner awareness for the inspiration and guidance of spirit. And I learned how to generate significant palpable good in my daily life, seeing it materialize with ease and grace, almost magically in some cases. As I continued to learn and grow, I became a licensed practitioner in October 2008. And on a closer look, I'm now seeing that perhaps I was being groomed for this role from way back then. Leadership as I see it is being able to exercise influence to enable others to achieve a goal. Author Jacob Morgan takes it a bit further. He describes a leader as someone who does more than just lead people. He says that leaders have to be driven by the right motivation and make a positive impact on the people around them. They see how things can be improved and are able to rally people to move toward a better vision. Does this sound like you? Consider the role that you play in your family, your community, your workplace, and here in this church. Can you see where and when you step up to the role of leader? 
Were we to add another layer, consider incorporating spirituality into leadership, and that opens the door for others to seek out and understand the inner terrain of their consciousness. This is because a spiritual leader demonstrates a genuine concern for the whole person and assists others in finding meaning in what they do. Spirituality in leadership implies that the focus will be more on people and less on formal position power, more on transformation and less on conformity, more on uh, partnership, collaboration and inspiration and less on controlling. Spiritual leaders draw strength from within. They work at self-improvement, not only as leaders, but as persons. They are respectful, believe in the ability of others, are attentive to people's needs, are concerned for their well-being. They put people first. They listen sincerely, communicate honestly, and treat everyone with dignity. In, it, in its deepest meaning, spirituality is about being human. As humans, we are social beings. We want to meet with others and communicate and work together to achieve goals. Isn't that correct? The work we have ahead of us here at the temple provides an excellent opportunity for us to come together in community. You see, our recently concluded Summit 2020 generated the critical first layers of our new strategic plan. Having shifted from a pastor-centered ministry to a mission-centered ministry, it is all up to us, to each and every single one of us, to facilitate the fine tuning and implementation of the actions and initiatives that will enable our church to thrive and to be financially viable. A big part of that will be helping each other embrace new possibilities as we build together the kind of future that we want for our church. As our founder, Dr. Ernest Holmes said, Man's mind should swing from inspiration to action, from contemplation to accomplishment, and from prayer to performance. So now the rubber hits the road. And yes, we're going to pray and pray hard, but we have to take action. And we have to do it in community. We have to do it together. As leaders in a spiritual community such as this, we must commit to modeling a way of relating to the challenges and opportunities of ministry that inspire others to take up meaningful roles in the life of the church. Whatever we want for our church won't show up unless we contribute to making it happen. I'll say that again. Whatever we want for our church won't show up unless we, every single one of us, contributes to making it happen. You know, the values of our church are, if I, if I recall, peace, or, or authenticity, integrity, love, and service. If they are what we say we stand on, we have to live them and we have to be them. We have to express and demonstrate service. We have to be in integrity. We have to experience and express peace. We have to be authentic, be our unique selves as God put us here and created us to be. And we have to embody and demonstrate love. If we are advocating that this teaching that we know as a science of mind can transform lives, we have to live by that teaching and demonstrate how it makes a difference in our own lives. We have to recognize that our spiritual practice, our observable spiritual practice, it must bring energy, raise consciousness, and inspire innovation in all aspects of our leadership, governance, and decision-making. 
It is my personal vision that every single person who is drawn to visit, spend time, learn and serve in this community develops the confidence and competence to independently apply the tools and principles of the science of mind to make a significant difference to the quality of their lives and well-being. Now, I'm committed to making that happen, to move this teaching from a wonderful, well-written, well-structured intellectual experience to one where if we are on the street in traffic, if we look at the balance in our bank account and it's not in keeping with what we would want, if something is, does not seem to be working in our lives, we can go immediately to one of the tools to go to spiritual mind healing treatment, to use the tools to become still and recognize and know that there is just one presence and one power. And it is expressing in, in all circumstances. And we can call all that power is always within us. And it can bring great value when one we embrace it and use it. Because I believe that if each of us thrives, then our church will thrive. And so we have a tool at our disposal and we need to use it. Now, our outgoing chair has been an absolutely great role model for us. She has been the driving force behind the transformation that has only just begun. I stand on her legacy and that of our founder, Dr. Elmo, to continue to build this church into the thriving enterprise that it already is in consciousness. As a quick aside, I've always noticed that our outgoing chair has some really nice shoes. <laughs> and seeing that I am a shoe Bessie, I often catch myself looking at her shoes first before noticing what else she's wearing. However, the fact is that our shoe sizes don't match. And that's very unfortunate because I would really become her best friend. So I can't and won't ever fit into her shoes. And rightly so, as I have my own shoes, my own style and energy. And that is what I'm going to bring to this new role. The call to spiritual leadership is a call to higher service. Author Stephen Covey says, and I quote, the inherent capacity to choose, to develop a new vision for ourselves, to re-script our lives, to begin a new habit or to let go of an old one, to forgive someone, to apologize, to make a promise and then keep it, is in any area of life is always, it always has been and always will be a moment of truth for every single leader. He goes on to say <laughs> that efficient management, because you know, in, in many organizations and in, in many circumstances, we know exactly what to do. We do all the right things. We put our business in order. But so, so this, this quote, quote I found very apt. Efficient management without effective leadership is like straightening the deck chairs on the Titanic after the iceberg hit. So friends, we want you. We want you to listen to the call of service, to the call of leadership. If you have an open mind, a generous heart, and willing hands, we welcome your support in any way you feel inspired to serve. If you, like me, grapple with the challenge of stepping up to leadership, there are a few things that I ask that you consider. Firstly, acknowledge the gifts and talent, talents with which you are blessed, and I'm sure there are many. We tend to always look at other persons and talk about them and how much they have, and, and then we look at ourselves and, and, and be concerned with what we think we don't have but I believe that we're all blessed with many, many gifts. Ident identify what they are and, and ask Spirit's guidance as to how you can share them. Then do so without as much as a hem or a haw. Speak to any one of our ministers 
or practitioners and ask how you may serve. We welcome you with open arms. And, and the same applies to our friends who are overseas. I mean, the, the world has now collapsed into one because of technology. We can access each other so easily. So feel free to join our groups and our committees. We will have meetings from time to time. And once you show that you have an interest, we welcome you with open arms. Be kind to yourself, that's the second point I want to make. I, I am very, very hard on myself from time to time. Um, I, sh you know, I, I speak a lot of shoulds and shouldn'ts, and I, um, um, and, and I oftentimes stop myself from doing some things because I feel that I'm not good enough. No, that has to stop. And I'm sure that if you have that same tendency, this is an ongoing journey, friends, and we have to know that when it happens, we do what we need to do to overcome those thoughts when they occur. One of the, th the other things I want to invite you to do, can you continue to grow by coming to class? There are a couple of classes coming up now. Mental equivalence start on Thursday. That's a really powerful learning experience. And I know that it will help to expand um, consciousness in a way that will allow us to embrace new possibilities for ourselves. And learn to practice, learn the steps to practice your own spiritual mind healing treatments. I can't begin to tell you how powerful that practice is. You know, I'll feel a, a, a feeling before, I'll do, you know, something negative around my business, my finances, uh, or whatever. And I do a treatment, and it does, it's, a, it's miraculous in how it serves to, to just shift the energy and open possibilities to, to, to allow some positive to flow into my life. It is one of the greatest tools of this teaching. The fourth thing, I invite you to partner with a practitioner. This is something that I believe we need to do more of. There are practitioners that are available who can do some amazing work with us. And if you don't feel to go into the, into the stuff yet, just invite the, um, the practitioner to just clarify some of the principles and, the, and the, the teachings that we have here. Even just to have that clarity can make a difference to you. I invite you to say these affirmations with me. I allow spirit to use all of me for good. I bring my inherent gifts to serve others today. My intuitive mind guides me in perfect ways. Uh, I'll say it one time. My intuitive mind guides me in the perfect ways of service to my spiritual community. My intuitive mind guides me in the perfect ways of service to my spiritual community. Everything I do is under the influence of spirit. Everything I do is under the influence of spirit. I believe that moving forward, I shall always be acting under the influence, guidance, and inspiration of spirit. I shall lead with love and lightheartedness, energy and enthusiasm, authenticity and accountability, diligence and dedication, excellence and efficiency, rigor and respect. That is what is a leader. As we close, I just invite you to close your eyes and just contemplate the words of this meditation inspired by Ernest Holmes. Um, it says, Spirit within me, command my soul to do thy bidding. Compel me to follow the course of truth and wisdom. Control my inward thoughts and outward ways. And make me to understand 
thy laws. Command me and my soul to turn to thee for wisdom and knowledge. Let the path of, paths of my life be made straight and sure. Let the journey of my soul find its completion in thee. Let the power that is born from within me pass into my experience without effort or labor. I rest in security and peace, for the inner, inner light shines forth and illumines my way. And so it is. Namaste.